The broadcast of the Minneapolis City Planning Commission will now begin. Um, hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, welcome to the regular meeting of the City Planning Commission for Monday, June 14th, 2021. And I ask that if anyone is not speaking to please mute yourself. So I think we have a bit of an echo. Um, my name is Raya Smiley. I'm the president of this commission and will be um, chairing this meeting. Um, as we begin, I just want to note for the record that this meeting includes the remote participation by members of the city council and city staff, as was authorized uh, by, under Minnesota statute section 13D21 um, due to the declared local public health emergency. The city uh, will be recording and posting this uh, meeting um, onto the city's website and the YouTube channel. This meeting is public and subject to the open meeting law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll so that we can verify that the quorum is present. Commissioner Boxley. Present. Commissioner Caprini. Present. Commissioner Ismaili. Here. Commissioner Ford. Here. Commissioner Marwa. Commissioner McGuire. Here. Commissioner Meyer. Here. <clears throat> Here. Commissioner Olson. Here. Commissioner Schrader. Here. Commissioner Sweezy. Here. And one more time, Commissioner Marwa. Here. Thank you. We have 10 members present. Perfect. So uh, that the record reflect that a quorum is in fact present. With that, we will proceed to the agenda. Uh, a copy of the agenda was posted on the city's legislative information management system or LIMS at LIMS.MinneapolisMN.gov. Uh, we will begin with the acceptance of the minutes of uh, the commission's meeting on uh, May 24th, 2021. Do I have a motion to accept those minutes? Commissioner Olson. So moved. And Commissioner McGuire. Second. A motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Okay, seeing none, I ask the clerk to please call the roll on that motion. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Sweezy. Aye. Commissioner Ismaili. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. Perfect. That motion passes and the minutes of our May 24th meeting are adopted. Our next order of business is to organize the public hearing agenda. Again, this was this is available on limbs.minneapolismn.gov. I will read through the agenda numbers and addresses and then we'll state whether it's been slated for consent, discussion, continuance, etc. Uh, just as a brief reminder, consent items are those that uh, will be passed uh, by the commission without any dis discussion. Um, we will basically go with the staff recommendation and any additional conditions that are associated with that um, with that item. If you agree with the recommendation and the conditions, you don't need to do anything. But if you disagree with that, uh, please speak up and indicate that you would like to speak against that decision. Um, with that, uh, oh, and then in order for you to speak up, you can press star six to do that. Staff recommendations for this, uh, uh, these 
items are uh, today are uh, item number four, which is the approval of the three items on the consent agenda from the May 27th Committee of the Whole. Um, these items are uh, currently on uh, the consent agenda uh, as it is. Is there anyone who disagrees with that? Okay, um, item number four remains on consent. Um, item number five, 747 Third Street North. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against this item? Anyone to speak against it? Star six, unmute you. Okay, hearing none, uh, item number five is put on consent. Item number six, 224 Cedar Lake Road South. Staff is recommending this item also for consent. Is there anyone um, here to speak against that? Okay, hearing none, um, the item number six is uh, put on consent. Item number seven, 216 7th Street South. We will be discussing this item. Item number eight, three, uh, 3301 and 3307 North 2nd Street. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against this item? If you are, uh, please press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, hearing none, uh, item number eight is put on consent. Item number nine, 2648 Marshall Street Northeast. Um, staff is recommending this item to be continued one cycle to the next planning commission meeting on June 28th, 2021. Uh, we will open this item for public hearing later, but um, at, as it stands, it's slated for continuance. Item number 10, 917 Emerson Avenue North. Staff is recommending this item for consent. Is there anyone to speak against it? Star six, unmute. Okay, hearing none, item number 10 is on consent. Item number 11 regulation of rooming units and congregate living facilities uh, ordinance. Staff is recommending this item for discussion. So just to quickly review, items uh, four, five, six, eight, and 10 are slated for consent. We will continue item number nine and items uh, seven and 11 will be discussed. Can I please have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Commissioner McGuire. I motion to approve the agenda as amended. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, seeing none, I ask the clerk to please call the roll on that motion. Apologies, folks. There we are. Okay, uh, Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. So they, they are Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Sweezy. Aye. Chair Smiley. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. Perfect. Uh, that motion passes and the agenda has been approved. Now we will proceed to um, handle the agenda in this order. First, I will open the public hearing 
uh, for our consent items and approve those items. And then after that, we will proceed to the continuance and discussion. With that, I will now open the public hearing on the consent agenda. Is there anyone who would like to speak on items 4, 5, 6, 8, or 10? If there's anyone, please press star 6 to unmute yourself and then continue with your uh, name and address and any comment that you are about to make. We'll just give it a few seconds. Anyone to speak on consent items? Okay, hearing no one, um, I will now close the public hearing for consent agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt items four, five, six, eight, and 10 on consent? Any of the commissioners? Commissioner McGuire. Um, I make a motion to adopt the items on the consent agenda. Thank you. A motion has been made. Commissioner Ford. I second it. Thank you. Motion made and seconded. Is there any discussion on the consent items? Okay. Seeing none, I ask the clerk to please call the roll on that motion. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Sweezy. Aye. Chair Ismaili. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. That, thank you, that motion passes. So if you were here for any of the agenda items, four, five, six, eight, or 10, uh, the application has been approved and uh, we will now move on to the next part of our agenda. So before we proceed to our discussion items, I would like to address item number nine, uh, 2648 Marshall Street Northeast. Uh, since this item was originally slated for tonight's uh, meeting, I am opening the, I will be opening the public hearing for any member of the public who is unable to, who's here tonight and is unable to attend uh, the June 28th planning commission meeting when this item will be heard and decided on. So with that, I am opening the public hearing on item number nine, and I will go based on the queue that we currently have, if there's anyone who would sleep, still uh, like to talk on um, or speak on item number nine um, and not in the next meeting. Uh, so, Again, public hearing open. Uh, the first, um, the first name that we have on our uh, queue is the applicant, um, Andrew uh, Watten Wattenhofer. If I said that correctly, if you are on the line, uh, you can um, press star six to unmute yourself and just state your name and number and proceed. Sorry, name and address, not number. If, if it's okay if you uh, prefer to speak at the next meeting because that's when we will in fact be talking about this item as well. Okay. Well, then we will. So I'm, I'm oh yeah. Hi. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, mute problem. My name is Andrew Wattenhofer. I am the homeowner. Uh, I'm present with my wife, Don Brent now as well. Um, well, we can speak at the next meeting. Yeah, okay. We, we were intending to do that, yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely uh, fine. 
just wanted to provide that opportunity for anyone who can't possibly like potentially not make it. Um, so we will hear from you at the next meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the next name that we have on the queue again, if you wish not to speak, it's absolutely OK. You can speak at the next meeting. Um, the next uh, person on the queue is Karen Peterson. If you're on the line and would like to speak tonight, you can press star six to unmute and then continue with your name and address. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Peterson. I live at 215 Broadway Street Northeast. Uh, I want to thank you all for this opportunity. I may be at the, at the next meeting, but I just want to get this in. Um, the Above Falls Master Plan was adopted by the City Council in June 2013, providing guidance and direction for the acquisition, development, management, and operation of the Above the Falls Park. The idea is a continuous park system that provides a destination park, expanding river access to an area that was long identified as largely ignored for decades, and enhances natural resources for natural resource quality. And it's consistent with Minnesota Statute 473-313, the Met Council requirement for master plan. And the East Bank Trail has been allocated a million dollars for design and construction. In addition to our current conversations with Hennepin County, Watershed Management, and um, Minnesota, the NPRB to develop this pedestrian trail. Work, this work is um, work ongoing, and then when it's completed, we will finally have the ground round finally become a reality. Um, this, the ATF takes an ecosystem approach, um, providing for natural riverfront restoration. In fact, shore land is a major, major essential part of this, and that is that um, our experts have, decide, have determined that a 50-foot buffer from the river is essential for um, uh, rebuilding the river bluffs into the natural habitat and allowing our plants and animals to, to survive and hopefully try. Um, the shoreland is the most important part of the landscape. And this proposal, even with the dispute over natural or altered bluff line, builds within this 50-foot buffer. And there's really no reason to believe that the park board can reuse this building. It's far more likely that it would be removed, probably filling up the construction land site. And as we discovered with the Sure Brothers site, anything can happen at any time, and we must be prepared for all such possibilities. New buildings in an area well known to become parkland moves us in the wrong direction. We'll make acquisition and development harder still. While I appreciate that this is private property and I appreciate all the work that the owners did in preparing their request, um, and speaking as the Sheridan neighborhood or represents, we simply must come down on the no to the variance to build within the 40 foot slope, no to the variance to build within the just the cast and accepted Mississippi River critical area for, um, at corridor, and no to the CUP for a cluster development. Why would we want to build a cluster development when we all know this is going to be part of And we can't know when at, that the acquisition will take 50 years by the owners. The Sure Brothers thought of that. This is a step in the absolute wrong direction. Please allow time for the watershed, well, you are allowing time for the park board and Mississippi watershed management the way, and I really appreciate that and appreciate the delay. And um, I thank you for your time and careful consideration. And it's a really important matter. Thank you. I'm back. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, our next uh, registered speaker is uh, Colleen O'Connor Toberman. If you're on the line, please press star six and proceed with your name and address. If, again, you can speak also at the next meeting. That's absolutely fine. Hello, this is Colleen. I can't make the next meeting, but I appreciate the chance to speak tonight. Um, my name is Colleen O'Connor Toberman. I'm with Friends of the Mississippi River, and I live at 2316 St. Anthony Parkway. Just want to speak really briefly to the uh, requested variance for the structure setback. Um, they want to, from my understanding, build a home into the bluff, um, which is not in compliance with the city's new Merca ordinance. And I just want to make sure the city's new ordinance is being correctly applied. It's not clear from the staff report whether the city has independently verified whether the bluff line on the property is naturally occurring or not. The staff report appears to rely on the applicant's own statement about that. So I'd just like to see the city uh, review this more thoroughly before deciding on this variance. 
Um, the Merca variant requires findings that uh, the bluff will not be negatively impacted by the variant. And so I don't know how we can possibly make that decision without more information about the current condition of the bluff and how it came to be. That's all, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mary McGuire. Uh, please proceed with your name and address and your comment. Hello. Hi. Hi, um, I'm Mary Jamin McGuire. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Above the Falls Community Advisory Committee. And I also think we need more information. So I, I sent a letter and I hope the commissioners will read the letter and I will wait for final comments until the next meeting. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you. Our next, thanks. Our next speaker is Irene Jones. Um, if you are on the line, uh, please proceed with your name and address and your comment. Again, you can also uh, comment at the next meeting. Okay, I see that Irene doesn't appear to be online, so we will continue on our list. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Lisa Hondras. Uh, oh gosh, Am I, say, I, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, so I apologize. If you are on the line, uh, you can press star six to unmute and continue with your name and address and comment. Is Lisa on the line? Okay. Yep. Okay. Lisa is not here. Um, this is also maybe due to the fact that this will be heard again at the next meeting. Um, our next speaker, registered speaker, is Edna Brazitis. Okay, I hear that Edna may not be here as well. If Edna is here, you can continue uh, pressing star six to unmute yourself. I'll just give it a second. Okay. Um, moving on on the queue, um, our next uh, registered speaker is Greg Elsner. If you're on the line and would like to come in tonight, um, please press star six and continue with your name and address. Is Greg Elsner on the line? Hmm. Okay, Greg may not be on the line. Um, Oh, Greg is here. Okay, I, staff is saying that um, Greg will, is planning to speak at the next meeting, so we will just continue uh, with the public hearing. Uh, although I did reach the end of our registered speakers, uh, speaker list. So at this point, I want to ask if there's anyone else on the call who would like to speak on item number nine tonight because you can't make it on uh, the next meeting, to the next meeting on June 28th. Please continue with pressing star six to unmute yourself and then uh, say your name and address and comment. Anyone else? I'll give it a few seconds. Hello, this is Greg Elsner. I'm not having an issue with my, my phone before. I just wanted to say, uh, we're in our comments and we'll talk about it at the next meeting. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Anyone else on the line who would like to speak on this item tonight and not at the next meeting? Okay, uh, not hearing anyone. I will now close the public hearing on item number nine. Is there any discussion or questions by the commission related to this item tonight at this point? Okay, not seeing um, anything in the chat. Um, I will now ask the commissioners if there's a motion to continue this item one cycle. Commissioner Meyer. 
I move to continue item nine to one cycle to June 28th. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Olson. Second. Uh, thanks. A motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, Commissioner Ford? Mm, I can't hear you. There, there we go. I'm wondering okay, if, if between now and our next meeting, we might, uh, I would appreciate at least getting some advice on exactly what our authority is uh, regarding um, this particular uh, item. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't, uh, I'd like to know what, well, how, um, no, there are, are there issues here that go beyond the, um, the report of the staff that uh, we are able to consider or not consider. I, I just have a better, like a sense of what is our scope of authority here. I appreciate that's, that. That's a great question. Thank you. And um, I guess at this point, I ask staff to keep us um, on the loop. And if you can provide an answer uh, to that um, between now and then, that will be great to just kind of shed some additional light on this item. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, this is not a direct answer to Commissioner Ford's question, but I just wanted to say a little bit about what I hope to accomplish we're accomplishing with this um, continuance because the Park Board staff is continuing to work with uh, the applicant and uh, the city staff. There are some ideas that, um, that they, they talked about in a meeting today that um, I would prefer to see more fleshed out. For example, um, they can consider agreeing to a bequest with the park board or um, they can consider a, a right of first refusal for the park board uh, to purchase it um, and, and there should be more discussion about the park board dedication ordinance um, which requires uh, which enables the park board to take 10 percent of the land so that that's part of the discussion and like a different commenter said um, the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization um, requested more time for them to review this and submit a letter to us. So um, I just wanted to to say that those were all uh, reasons that I requested uh, that this be continued. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Um, is there any additional comments or questions by the commission? Okay. Seeing none, I um, again a motion has been made and seconded. So I ask the clerk to please call the roll on that motion. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Hi. I'm sorry. Did you hear oh, me? Sorry. You are. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Marwa. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Sweezy. Aye. Chair Smiley. Aye and zero nays. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, that motion passes and item number nine is going to be continued to the next meeting of the commission. We will now move on uh, to the discussion items. Again, these are items that we will take public testimony on and deliberate on it and then make a decision. So I will open for each item, I will open the public hearing um, and then I will close it and then we will continue with the uh, discussion amongst the commission. Well, and this is, um, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and the staff may address any questions that the commissioners have at that point. Um, so, and, and then one thing is that after the public hearing for an item is closed, um, 
we will act on that motion. Uh, the, the two items that are slated for discussion are item number seven, 216 7th Street South, and item number 11, Regulation of Rooming Units and Congregate Living Facilities Ordinance. We will start with item number seven, uh, 216 7th Street South, um, and the staff and staff is Peter Crandall. You can you can start your presentation, Peter. Good evening, commissioners. Um, item number seven is located at 216 7th Avenue South. <clears throat> this is in the downtown central business core. It is a somewhat smaller parcel on the block currently zoned for the B42 district with the downtown parking overlay district and the BFC 50 or core 50 built form overlay district, which is the highest intensity built form zoning district. Um, it's a 10,000 square foot approximately parcel that is currently occupied by a um, five story existing structure that was formerly utilized as an athletic club. That structure is currently vacant and is under common ownership with the hotel use, formerly the Minneapolis Grand Hotel. Um, going to be the Hyatt Centric Hotel property that is contiguous to the to the um, subject site and which has frontage along 2nd Avenue South. The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing structure on the site in order to establish a new 20 space accessory surface parking lot that would be accessed off of 7th Street South. You can go to the next slide. This is a um, demolition plan for the existing structure on the site. It takes up most of that existing parcel and is connected to that existing hotel use um, that fronts along 2nd Avenue South. Next slide. And then the proposed surface parking lot um, that would take its place. The applicant is also proposing to construct a small uh, pedestrian plaza along the public right of way at the south end of that existing parcel. That plaza would be landscaped, maintained, um, and programmed by the hotel use on the adjacent parcel and would be publicly accessible during the day as a publicly accessible open space. Next slide. And then this is just a proposed landscape plan. Um, they are proposing some fencing along the front and sides of that existing um, or of that proposed pedestrian space so that the space can be secured at night. And then some additional landscaping at the rear of the proposed parkings, uh, parking lot. Next slide. And that might be it actually. <clears throat> um, so uh, an accessory parking lot of 20 spaces or less is a uh, allowed conditional use in the downtown parking overlay district. This uh, parcel is considered accessory to the hotel use because it's under common ownership and with um, contiguous parcels with that uh, existing hotel structure um, fronting along 2nd Avenue there. So I can um, pause there and take any questions and then I know the applicant is also present and can answer questions as well. Thank you for that presentation, uh, Peter. Does the commission have any questions for staff? Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. So in the agenda packet, uh, I believe it was the applicant's letter that says that it's um, proposed to be a temporary parking lot until they build a new building. Um, but the, if we approve this application today, this would not have any restrictions that it be temporary, as, um, at least as far as I can tell. And I just wanted to confirm that. Is, is that correct? Like, would, would this be, would, if we approve this, would this be conferring a permanent right to a parking lot there? Yes, it would be confirming a conditional use to establish a parking lot there. And as long as that use was maintained um, and operational and under the same ownership as the hotel use, then it, it could go forward without restriction in terms of the 
timeline. So it's not being proposed as an interim use. It's a established permanent use. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McGuire. Uh, thank you. So with this proposal, it didn't look like they were proposing to combine the lots. So I guess my question is what prevents the owner from um, transferring the ownership to another group and then just having it be like a paid surface lot for downtown um, and really keeping it accessory to the hotel use? I hope that question makes sense. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. So the downtown parking overlay district does not allow the establishment of new commercial surface parking lots. So if ownership were to change and someone were to attempt to use the parking lot as a commercial parking lot, that would not be an allowed use. It's only allowed as an accessory use. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ford. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm trying to understand what is the physical relationship of this uh, parking lot to the actual hotel. You mean um, how is it situated in relationship to well, the it, hotel building? Or is it is it attached? Is it uh, is it is, is, is it just a a parking lot surrounded by? Um, you know, is there any kind of connection to the hotel? Yes, I believe there would be connection to the parking lot from the rear of the hotel because there's um, currently an existing connection to the athletic club building from that building. I don't have proposed plans for the hotel use, but the applicant can confirm probably what the intention is in terms of access there. I'm, I'm looking at the, thank you, I'm, I'm looking at uh, one of the plans, one that shows all the landscaping, and I can't, I can't see where it connects, but I'd be happy to be told. Sure, yeah, I'll have the applicant speak further okay. to that question. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission for staff? Um, in that case, I actually have a question uh, myself. One of them was answered. But my other question is about, um, I guess, um, who owns this building right now? And also, was there not a, another better use of a vacant building and is demolishing it, is, is, is that the only way to go? I will have the applicant speak a little bit to that question. Um, what I can say about the existing structure is that it was not deemed to be historically significant. So that's really the main um, avenue through which the city would prevent someone from demolishing a structure. But all of the applicants speak a little bit to their explorations of um, reusing the use or the existing structure versus, um, you know, potential future development scenarios. Okay, thank you. Um, any additional questions from the commission before I open the public hearing and we will hear from the applicant at that point. Okay, seeing a none, I will now open the public hearing and I hear that the applicant is here to speak. If so, Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record. Good afternoon. We heard you for a second. Good afternoon. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Eric Hager. I'm one of the owners of a hotel. Uh, I represent Magna Hospitality, and our address is 300 Centerville Road, Suite 300 East, and that's in Warwick, Rhode Island. Um, a couple of the questions that were raised, I think the first one uh, dealt with the connection of our hotel to the parking lot. And currently, um, the hotel has a fire escape on the east side of the building, and that fire escape discharges on the roof of the annex building and down through a stair and uh, out the, onto the front side of the building. Uh, when we take the building down, that fire escape will then discharge down to the ground level and across the parking lot. And then there's also a secondary connection from the current 
basement of a hotel building that will egress up um, up a set of stairs uh, onto the parking lot and then back out onto the street. So those are really the primary connections between the parking lot and the hotel. Does that answer that question? Did that answer your question, Commissioner Ford? Yeah, uh, so partially. So who is it? Who is intended to be using this space? The intent is for the hotel valet to park or for guests to self park um, in the 20 space parking lot. It will be an accessory used to the hotel for hotel guests. And so would they be um, entering and exiting the hotel through that through the uh, the um, the, uh, the spot you just indicated? No, they would not. That's primarily a back of house connection. So guests would be parking their cars, walking onto the sidewalk around the corner uh, and into, then into the main entrance of the hotel. Mm, OK, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. And um, sorry, go ahead. Yep, and I think the next question um, we were asked about a, a better use for this building. Um, and we wish there was. We spent a lot of time and energy trying to strategize and figure out how to use this building. We had hoped that we could have kept Lifetime Fitness in space or find another fitness uh, center franchise to come out and lease the space from us. Um, but unfortunately, the condition of the building and the age of the building prevented that, especially when there are some nicer fitness centers um, you know, in close proximity. Right now, you know, I think the building was constructed in the early 1980s. It has no elevators, so the only elevators that service the space are actually the hotel elevators. Also, because it was used as a fitness center, it has a very awkward floor plate configuration that isn't particularly suitable to office space or residential or any other uses. You know, there's a large basketball court. There are locker rooms with low ceilings. Um, there are a series of fitness studios that are all on slightly different levels. That one needs to take different sets of stairs to access them. So overall, it's a very inefficient and awkward space. Um, so we made the decision that the, the best thing that we could do was to, was to take it down. Thank you for answering that question. Um, are there any other questions for the applicant from the commission? Commissioner Baxley. Thank you. Yeah, I was just, uh, could you talk a little bit about um, the concrete sidewalk as described, uh, the amenity space there in front that you're creating and how that works with the hotel or what you're what, what you're envisioning for that would be great to know. Sure. Uh, our intent for that space is we wanted to program a flexible space that could be used by the hotel, uh, you know, possibly some of the adjacent, you know, property owners. We know that you know, there's a pub on the corner, so our thoughts were that perhaps we could, you know, work out a lease arrangement with them where we could put some outdoor seating and they could possibly use it uh, as an outdoor dining space. The hotel could have events outside. It's really designed just to be a, you know, an open uh, space that could be used for a variety of purposes. And that also screens the view of the parking lot from the sidewalk and the other pedestrian space. Yeah, and it's an interesting spot. It's um, um, completely shadowed by the buildings across the street. Doesn't get much daylight in there, but I could see accessory to the pub could be pretty interesting. Are you worried that uh, also by screening, we're also creating a um, no eyes back in that parking lot. How is how is security being handled by the hotel for that space? Yeah. Uh, our intent would be to we're, we're going to uh, light the space. We'll be providing some some light at night, so it will be a lit parking lot. But otherwise, it wouldn't question? be. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. But there's no. I mean, there, I, yeah. Are you going to have cameras? And, and like, I just, you know, the, really, there won't be any eyes on that space at all. Right. Um, we could definitely put some cameras back in the space. You know, our thought would be that 
you know, given that it is an active hotel, there would be a fair amount of you know, traffic coming in and out. There would be people that are using the parking lot um, and it would be managed and controlled by the hotel staff. And it, and it, it will be, it'll be full access from the from the alley. There's no gate or, or closing off of that, correct? Correct. There is a fence uh, around the public plaza, but there will not be gated access back to the to the uh, parking lot. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission for the applicant before we move on? Yes. Uh I have a question. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm not very good at reading plans. Apparently, uh, can you tell me what is the frontage on Seventh Street? The, the distance. I believe it's about sixty feet. I believe the approximate dimensions of the plaza are forty by fifty, and then you have a drive lane on the west side to access the parking lot. Is this the number I, I see a 66 on the one of the uh, plans? Is that the, uh, the width of the space? I believe that space? is correct. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Commissioner Baxley? Was Sorry, that you? Commissioner Ford. I think on the, there's a 20 foot drive aisle. It's 51 and a half feet wide uh, on the inside. So it's a, it's about 70 three feet total width building the fence building the property line thank you any additional questions comments for the applicant okay seeing none we will continue with the list of our registered speakers our next person who's registered is also also seems to be part of the applicant team brian bell uh, I don't know if you have anything uh, that you would like to add. Um, if so, please press star six to unmute and continue with your name and address. Otherwise, we can move on. Okay. Uh, moving to the next person who is on the uh, list um, Mitchell Kukis. Gosh, did I say that correctly? Um, if you are on the line, please press star six to unmute yourself and then continue with your name and address and comment. Star six unmutes. Hi, this is Mitchell Kukis with Kimley Horn. Um, we helped prepare the, the civil and the landscape plans, but have no further comments. Thank you for the, the consideration. Sure, thank you. And our well, last registered speaker is, and I'm, gosh, I, I apologize in advance for my pronunciation. Uh, Johnny Villiet, did I say that correctly, even remotely? If you're on the yeah. line, okay, go ahead. Uh, also, just just part of the design team here for support, but no further comments. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Th that actually concludes the list of our registered speakers. Is there anyone else on the line who didn't register in advance who would like to speak to this item? If there is anyone and you would like to talk right now, uh, you can press star six to unmute yourself and then continue with your name and address. I will give it a few seconds. Okay, uh, hearing uh, no one, I will now close the public hearing. And is there any additional discussion or question by the commission related to this item? Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. So this uh, proposal, you know, is in the downtown parking overlay district um, right next to the Capella Tower, one of the tallest towers in the city. And I just want to read the purpose statement of the downtown parking overlay over district. So it reads, 
Uh, the downtown parking overlay district is established to preserve significant and useful buildings and to protect the unique character of the downtown area and the mixed use downtown neighborhoods by restricting the establishment or expansion of surface parking lots and establishing certain minimum and maximum off street parking standards in the downtown area. So I just want to clarify, you know, that it's, you know, um, official stated policy that we want to you know, restrict the expansion or establishment of, of surface parking lots in this area. Um, if this proposal was made in other parts of the city, it would be granted by right. They wouldn't need to come before the Planning Commission. Be, be, but because of, of of this downtown overlay district, um, you know, that's why uh, they need to seek approval. And um, I don't think that we should grant it for a couple different reasons. Um, you know, I'm and this particular building, I, um, I don't have any objection to replacing it with a different building, but I don't think it should be a parking lot. And um, you know, in the um, in the staff report, um, you know, some of the the findings that need to be made, um, you know, adequate measures have, have been or will be taken to minimize traffic congestion in the public streets. And, and the staff report says that, you know, the, the 20 space vehicle surface parking lot is not expected to generate significant traffic congestion, um, but it doesn't do anything to mitigate what it, what, what it would create. And, you know, part of the objective is to um, reduce vehicle traffic congestion um, in the downtown core where it's um, where, the, where there's a lot of congestion and where there is very um, significant um, uh, public transit and then you know just uh, compatibility with with the 2040 plan um, you know, in, improving pedestrian space and um, public realm and um, and other um, goals of the 2040 plan I don't believe uh, that a surface parking lot contributes to that I feel like it's um, going in, in the opposite direction to um, lose the density of a building and 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 get surface parking lot and, and the city um, has made it clear that's not the direction that we want to go. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, listen to what other commissioners have to say. If if the sense is um, that it's that there's going to be support for it, I'll let someone else make the motion and vote no. Um, if it seems like other commissioners are opposed as well, then I will make a motion to deny. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you. Um, I have similar comments to Commissioner Meyer. Um, I have a hard time voting to tear down a five story building to put up a 20 stall parking lot. I don't think that really benefits the public and I have a hard time believing that that public plaza is going to be used um, by the plot by the public. I think, um, you know, something like what Commissioner Baxley said about safety and who's going to really use that site. I don't really see myself as um, a young woman sitting downtown in a plaza right next to an entrance to a parking lot. Um, I, I think I'd be open to an interim solution here if the building really is that weird. Um, I would be open to like an interim use permit or um, a temporary permit to allow a parking lot on site um, with the requirement that they come back in a certain amount of time. Um, but. I don't see another building being built there anytime soon with the cost of construction continuing to go up. Um, so I think if we want a building there, we need to vote no to this because um, I just don't see something coming back. Um, so yeah, similar to Commissioner Meyer, I just I won't be supporting this um, because I don't think we need more parking lots in our active downtown. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McGuire. Commissioner Ford. Thank you. Uh, I, I join with uh, Commissioner Meyer and Commissioner McGuire uh, in their comments, and I would add to it, uh, to those comments, uh, the notion of uh, the pedestrian experience on, on 7th Street, one of our major streets in the city. We're going to be creating in the middle of the block a 70 foot um, gap in, in the pedestrian uh, experience that uh, is you know, a, a bunch of cars. Uh, and I don't think that's uh, uh, in, in any way enlivens our city. And also, of course, there is gonna be a, um, a, a um, interface between cars parking in that lot and people 
fussing uh, on the on the um, uh, on the sidewalk. I understand that presumably this little um, plaza area will uh, will uh, you know obviously will direct the cars into a, a smaller driveway. But just the notion of of um, having a dark, sunless, um, 70 feet uh, interruption of the pedestrian urban experience, uh, it, it strikes me as just uh, not at all what we're trying to do, and I'll be voting no also. Thank you, Commissioner Ford. Commissioner Marwa. Hi, I think um, my, I agree with what my fellow commissioners also said, um, what uh, Commissioner Ford just said about the pedestrian experience. We always want more infill developments, these type of small lot developments to see uh, come up in the city, and we are doing the exact opposite here if we approve this. I also am confused at how this is more economically uh, feasible than trying to contract out parking in an existing lot for 20 spaces, um, but that's, that's just me. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Sweezy. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Um, I have a different point of view um, on this than the other commissioners. I think that um, under these circumstances and right now, I think that this is um, a relatively small thing. I don't think we're talking about a huge surface parking lot issue here. I think that the building is going to come down and the spot's going to be empty. And um, we can either have it used by a hotel in downtown and put it to some use at all, or it can sit as an empty spot and just be blight on downtown, which we absolutely do not need right now. Um, if it is a, a 20 a 20 space parking uh, parking lot is small um, and can be can be lit and can be used for valets back and forth to support a business downtown. Um, I think on balance, um, it's not a significant deviation from um, city goals. And in fact, I think it supports some of the other city goals, particularly those uh, for downtown. So under these circumstances, um, I, I, um, I think I would go with staff's recommendation here um, and would either support a motion to approve it or vote against a motion not to approve it. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Sweezy. Commissioner Baxley? Um, one other question regarding um, stormwater, and maybe that's for the design team. Um, and we're taking a building that assumingly, uh, assumingly collected its rainwater off the roof, piped it down, or maybe it was overflow. But it appears we're just sheet draining this parking lot back out into the street. Could you just talk a little bit about how stormwater is being handled and processed um, predisposition into the system? Is there anyone from the applicant team who would like to take that question or even staff if you have an the answer? Yeah, this is Mitchell Kukis again with Kimley Horn. Um, the city's stormwater requirements don't factor in unless it's uh, an acre of land disturbance. And in this case being underneath that, um, it wasn't a, a regulation or a requirement. Um, however, I will point out that Right now with the, the building, essentially in pavement covering the whole lot, there'll be a slight increase in the, the green space in the, the pervious area by adding some uh, landscaping and plantings around the proposed um, plaza area. Most of those plantings are we're basically sticking those in rock mulch, I think. So yeah, it is, um, it is accepting some rainwater, but um, um, not too much, but how is the is the site draining out towards the front? Where where is the stormwater going um, from the lot? Yes, it, it does drain um, towards the street, towards the the, the right of way. It, it it drains away from the building. So all the stormwater in a heavy road will be running down out the entrance to the parking lot into the street. It will get, can, uh, let me, um, 
Let me check on something here. I apologize. One second. Yeah, I'm just I'm just looking on the plan, looking at all your slope directions, and it appears I think it's just all it's curbed. The whole thing's curbed and gutted, right? And so, and I don't see any catch basins or anything. Correct. Yep, it's just surface flowing. And right now, the, the the building itself, you know, is all impervious and it's not being treated. It it, it gets pipes to the city storm sewer. In this case, it would just go um, over land, across the pavement. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Caprini. Uh, thank you, uh, President. So I will not be turning on my camera. I am changing the baby's diaper um, at this moment, and I've got to be quick so she doesn't move around too much. Um, I really respect and appreciate uh, Commissioner Meyer's um, uh, thoughts and opinions um, about this parking lot. I, too, am concerned about um, the environment as, as much as all of us are. Um, but Commissioner Sweezy uh, said something that I thought was um, the kind of struck something with me um, that uh, it's 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 not a, a huge um, parking ramp. I believe it was what 20 cars. And if it's going to support the business, um, you know, the hotel um, that supports jobs. And um, the other piece that kind of struck me um, was, excuse me one second, no, no, do that, um, is that uh, where did I go? Oh, she's got me confused. <laughs> um, Blight, the empty uh, parking lot, or you know, the empty, just the empty lot itself, and what it would take to actually find a developer that would be willing to do something that's meaningful um, with that space. So I am, um, I do, I appreciate um, all of the commissioners' questions and uh, their concerns about, um, you know, too many cars on the street, um, but I, I have to say that I, I do agree with Commissioner Sweezy. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you, Commissioner Caprini. I actually have a couple of questions and comments. If Is there anyone else from the commission who would like to speak first, though? OK. Um, I have one, actually, oh, they're all questions. One is uh, that was sparked by Commissioner Sweezy's uh, comment. Is this building being demolished regardless is my first question, or if this is not approved, the building will stay there, um, it, it, though vacant, but will stay. That's my first question. And then the second question is, if that building is in fact demolished, now you have uh, since this is five stories, now you have very large wall space on both sides of this um, little surface parking lot that I am wondering what will happen to that or will we be seeing the side of a building that wasn't exactly intended to be seen? Uh, anyone from the applicant team or staff? would like to take that question. I'd appreciate it. Sure, this is Eric Hager, the applicant again. To answer the first question, yes, the building is going to be coming down regardless of whether or not the parking lot and plaza are approved. To answer the second question, yes, there. once the building is taken down, we will see the exposed elevations of the adjacent buildings. Um, on the hotel portion, um, the hotel was built you know, much prior to the, uh, the the fitness facility. So presumably there's an exterior elevation there that will be uncovered. That was originally intended to be an exterior elevation it, um, is, is brick and we will be patching it um, um, to, a, to an acceptable condition. To the north and the west of the site, the Capella Tower, um, we've done some exploratory investigation. We're not 100% confident what's going to be there, but we believe it is um, a concrete wall that uh, will also be cleaned and painted uh, once our building comes down. So is that potentially something like a, so you are uh, communicating and in um, contact with um, the other building, potentially even exploring something else besides just uh, paint 
we have been coordinating with the uh, adjacent property owners. Um, if they would like to do something that's different from paint, um, you know, it's definitely something that they can do. Um, but at this point, we don't have anything beyond that uh, factored into our plan. Got it. Thank you. And I guess I would say um, my next question is for staff, actually. Uh, going back to something that Commissioner McGuire said, whether or not, um, or something between Commissioner Meyer and McGuire, whether or not um, this at all is possible to be um, somewhat of a um, time limited conditional use or um, or there isn't a way around it, basically. Um, President Esmiley, the applicant could seek an interim use permit to establish the parking lot for a period of up to five years, but we don't have a way to compel them to do that. And because a conditional use is allowed in the district, they are allowed to apply for that as a more permanent established use. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Baxley. Sorry, one more question. What? So if the building is demolished, what is the expectation um, of the condition of the of the site post demolition is there do we do we have the ability to affect that or is there minimum requirements in terms of what the what the lot needs to be it's a staff question i guess can you state that one more time commissioner baxley i'm sorry if the building is going to be demolished uh, what is the expectation that we have or the city has of the surface condition like how how is it to be left and do we have any say in that um the city would would likely require it to be conditioned in such a way that it was secure and maintained to a you know a visually acceptable condition um but it you know, it is still considered accessory to the hotel use, so they would be primarily responsible for that as long as the ownership was the same. Um, it could obviously then, you know, be dispossessed and utilized for a different kind of use. Um, but yeah, there would be a minimum expectation for how the site is maintained in the short term. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Yeah, um, if, if the applicant came back and requested an interim permit with, you know, a, a strict time limitation and um, I, I don't know how that works. I don't know how you like remove a parking lot once it's built and um, and the permit expires, but um, I, I am open to considering that if if there's a way that that actually gets enforced somehow um, in the packet. Um, you know, they, they say that um, the applicant or somebody has um, presented proposals for a new building that they want to build there um, and that the neighborhood association likes the new building or something. Um, they, they didn't include anything about that new building in the, in the packet um, for us to see. Um, but you know, I, I believe that they have that intent, which makes it makes me wonder what, why they you know have have sought this permanent uh, conditional use permit um, rather than uh, the interim one. Um, so um, you know, I, I I would just um, urge commissioners to vote this down uh, so that we don't have a permanent parking lot there. Um, if the applicant wants to, they can request an interim one later. Um, so I, I'm going to go ahead and just um, make the motion uh, to deny um, on, on the basis that uh, in regard to um, item number four, um, uh, or finding number four, excuse me, um, that this would uh, increase uh, vehicle traffic congestion. And in regard to um, item number five, um, 
the plan um, would not further or would go against um, 2040 plan items uh, 6, 9, 10, and 16. And I'll just highlight 16, you know, um, the environmental impacts of transportation to reduce uh, the energy, carbon, and health impacts of transportation through reduced single occupancy vehicle trips and phasing out of fossil fuel vehicles. I feel that's particularly uh, pertinent uh, to this one in the downtown area where, we, where there's a higher concentration of air pollution than elsewhere in the city. So the health impacts in particular are more important there. Um, so for those reasons, I would, I would move to deny the conditional use permit. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, so a motion has been made. Is there a second? Commissioner Olson. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, this is um, to deny the conditional use permit. Any discussion? Commissioner Caprini. Yeah, so um, again, I really do appreciate Commissioner um, Meyer's um, thoughts on, on and everything that he has said. But I guess for me, I'm thinking like, in 20 years, we could feasibly have like uh, so many people in Minneapolis, or for that matter, in the state of Minnesota, driving electrical cars. Where are they going to park? I mean, I understand we want to get to a space where we're using more uh, mass transit. I'm not opposed to that at all. But for myself personally, um, unless the bus is going to come pick me up in front of the house, I, I, I probably won't ride it as often as a lot of other people do. And I don't mean, I don't say that to be glib, I say that to be honest. Um, and also speaking from um, the area in which I live, um, cars are, 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 are necessary. And um, I do want to see more ridership, absolutely, because it's good for the environment. But this whole push towards electric vehicles, I, could it be 20 years? I mean, I've raised two kids, 20 years flies by. You blink your eye and all of a sudden they're graduating from college. So I guess to my, I guess I'm saying, um, that's all I'm saying. And now I'm going to stop. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Caprini. Are there any other discussion on this motion? Any, any other comments that commissioners would like to make before we take a vote? Okay, seeing none. Uh, I ask the clerk to please call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. Yes, Abstain. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Barwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Sweezy. No. Chair Smiley. Aye. Eight yeas, one nay, and one abstention. Um, thank you. With that, that motion carries, and the again the motion was to deny the conditional use permit. Uh, so with that, sorry, let me just get my bearings. Um, with that, we can move on to the next discussion item. Um, I think this basically goes back to, and staff can correct me if I am wrong, the application will go back um, to the staff and applicant and they can they can think of uh, or work on potentially another uh, solution and come back. Is that correct? Someone can confirm. That is one potential option. They also have the option to appeal the denial to the city council. Yes. Thank you for reminding me that, of that. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, okay, with that, we will move on to the next um, agenda item that is for discussion. 
Uh, item number 11, regulation of rooming units and congregate living facilities ordinance and staff is Amber Turnquist. Good afternoon, President Ismaili and the members of the Planning Commission. Amber Turnquist, Principal City Planner, along with Planning Manager Jason Wittenberg, will be presenting on the single room occupancy text amendment. The single room occupancy text amendments aim, sorry, next page, uh, is to achieve the Minneapolis 2040 goals of more residents and jobs and more affordable and accessible housing. It also serves to advance policies 35 and 40 of pursuing innovative housing types and eliminating homelessness. Next slide, please. Through research and discussions with stakeholders, SROs are intended to provide housing for people who are at risk of homelessness and who use shelters due to lack of affordable housing options. The amendment would allow units that would fill a gap in the affordable housing continuum for people who earn low wages or work intermittently. Next slide, please. While Jason can get into more detail, I wanted to highlight the new and, that new and remodeled buildings in the Interior 1 district would be small scale residential. Individual lots are permitted to have up to three dwelling units, while combining of lots is generally not permitted. New and remodeled buildings in the Interior 2 district should be small scale residential as well, although those lots are permitted, and while those lots are also permitted to have three dwelling units, multifamily buildings with three or more units are permitted on larger lots. Next slide, please. The definition of single room occupancy is a facility providing housing that is operated by a nonprofit organization, government agency, or healthcare agency as defined by chapter 244 housing maintenance code. It does not include community residential facilities, room and care homes, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and supportive housing. Next slide, please. Rooming type units are currently allowed only when establishing housing with supportive services, such as nursing homes and those listed above. While SROs are proposed to be classified as a type of congregant living with the, within the zoning code, SROs themselves would not include supportive services. Next slide, please. Jason. Thank you, Amber. Uh, regarding the locations where SROs would be allowed, the recommendation in front of you would make SRO housing uh, permitted in all of the same zoning districts where multifamily housing of four or more units is also allowed. So translated to our current primary zoning districts, our uh, SROs would be allowed starting in R3 um, and in every district higher than that that allows uh, residential uses. In R3, a 7,500 square feet of lot area would be required for an SRO building. In all other districts, the minimum would be 5,000 square feet. Uh, as Amber noted, uh, the, the city's comprehensive plan calls for allowing no more than three units on properties in the interior one district and on standard size lots in the interior two district. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the characteristics of uh, SRO, um, of the SRO uh, standards, uh, the, the zoning amendment largely just addresses which districts the use is allowed in or would be allowed in and what size of lot is required. Uh, there is a companion amendment to the Housing Maintenance Code that will be considered uh, by the City Council th at the same time when the, this zoning code change is uh, reviewed by the Council as well. Uh, each living unit uh, would not be required to have uh, kitchen or bathroom facilities and uh, therefore would not be considered a dwelling unit. Um, that Essentially, uh, it's a it's a rooming unit that has not been a uh, type of housing uh, authorized in the city for uh, a number of years. There are, of course, a number of rooming units that exist in the city as legal non-conforming uses that were established quite some time ago. Uh, the housing maintenance code would require that no more than two occupants uh, uh, reside in each room. Uh, the zoning ordinance change would make it clear that rooming units are not subject to the minimum uh, zoning requirements related to floor area uh, and that those issues would be addressed through the billing code and housing maintenance code, which uh, are really a, a calculation based on 
uh, on life safety largely. And then uh, finally, uh, and this is uh, a, perhaps a point of, of some uh, contention, uh, SRO units uh, could only be established by a nonprofit or government agency with a track record of successfully managing housing. Uh, and then licenses would be required uh, through regulatory services. Um, I'll note that um, during the formation of the ordinance, um, as I think Amber referenced, there was some discussion with stakeholders that included organizations who have experience managing this type of housing. And while I don't think there was unanimous agreement about um, the requirement related to nonprofit uh, a government operator requirement, uh, certainly our recollection is that most kind of understood and appreciated the desire to kind of wade into this um, into this somewhat slowly as we re-legalize re this type of housing. Um, again, I'll just note that um, if, if, if things go well with this uh, wading into this uh, somewhat uh, slow manner, uh, it's certainly uh, the intent that this uh, could be revisited again in the future and that um, a wider range of operators could be considered um, in the future. Um, with that, I think I will uh, stand for questions, both Amber and I. Thank you, Amber and Jason, for your presentation. Um, are there any questions from the commission for staff? Commissioner Caprini. So um, one thing that kind of, um, I, first of all, I'm really excited about this. I think this is awesome. But one thing that's disappointing to me is that there is no requirement for um, a bathroom or kitchen. And I say that because there, from in my mind, I'm thinking, well, what about a half bath, just a toilet and a shower and just like some tiny space kitchenette type thing? Doesn't have to be terribly large. Um, I hope that uh, in the future, if this is something that works um, and there is some progress and success with it, that that eventually um, becomes a part of, of the um, of the uh, design of these particular uh, SROs. Um, the other thing is, um, it said that it was would only um, allow for two occupants in each, <clears throat> excuse me, each room. Could that be a parent and their child? Um, and and maybe that's something that people are thinking about in the future. And that's why I bring up the kitchen and the half bathroom. Um, simply because I think that this type of housing um, not only absolutely needs to be all over the city and not concentrated in one area. Um, it, it would uh, support um, Minneapolis public schools in, in the sense that if there were parent, uh, single parents that had children and their, the, these particular types of developments were in areas where we find um, uh, far less diversity um, in our, uh, in our community, in some of the community schools. So, so that's it. Unless something else comes up, I'll stop. Thank you. Commissioner Ford. Thank you. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, first of all, a comment. Uh, I, I'm, I, I too am happy to see this. Glad, very glad to see this. Um, my time on the city council, 50 years ago now, uh, we were dealing with getting rid of SROs, but they were, uh, at the time, they were kind of the to see this proposal coming forward, perhaps 50 years later. <laughs> My question is, uh, you talked about the um, that uh, these uh, SROs had to be established by nonprofits, health agencies, et cetera, government units, et cetera. Um, what does established mean? And, and, I'm, and I, what I'm getting at is, um, could it be owned by a nonprofit but managed by a professional, by a for-profit corporation? Um, just a quick uh, comment before staff respond to that. Uh, Commissioner Ford, just so you know, you did cut it out a little bit right before well, you asked your question. Uh, so if, you, if anything you said right before your question, if you would like to repeat that, otherwise we can um, move on with the question and answer well, itself. 
I, I was uh, I was doing a mea culpa for the uh, work that we didn't do uh, back in the 70s in terms of providing for a well-regulated and well-operated SRO system. But my question was um, the dif distinction between established and managed and um, uh, for-profit for and non-profit. Sure, uh, thank you, Commissioner, for the question. And I believe the language in the ordinance is uh, that it must be operated by. So I, I um, unless our, our regulatory services staff, who perhaps was going to join us, uh, has uh, something else to add, uh, I believe the, the license essentially would be granted to uh, a nonprofit or government agency when, when th that um, application process happens. As the actual manager and operator of the facility. Correct. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Olson. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering, so the difference between this and like a, a hostel obviously would be that it's managed by a nonprofit, but is there also like a, a amount of time someone is required or like, is there a max amount of time that someone is allowed to stay here? Uh, Commissioner Olson, unlike some of our shelter rules for, for certain shelter type of uses, there is no limit that the city would establish regarding the, the tenure of, of people who live in, in SRO facilities. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Marwa. Hi, um, my question was also about the, the qualification that a nonprofit have to be the developer of this type of housing product. Is it, I guess, what's the, a little bit of what the intention is behind that? I'm seeing a market for this type of housing pop up in other cities where I'm working right now that's not really just limited to people who have experienced homelessness, but kind of into the market of adult dorms that people can, you know, can't want to live in a city, but can't, you know, necessarily afford anything bigger than you know this and there's been a market for small small scale developers to be building and i'm specifically thinking of one project that's um associated with they built it for their workforce to be able to live in it as well and so um it's we're working in a farming community outside of um, napa and so that's where that one is and there that's why this product is there and so there's a lot of different de type of developers who are looking at this type of product why is there a specificity on this about just being nonprofits who to develop it because I feel like if you can open this up a little bit further there could be a larger market for it and maybe the product would also be different it could product be you know a little bit better too sure uh, thanks for uh, for asking that Commissioner Mawat so uh, a bit of context is that some of this discussion really got moving when Hennepin County one of our government partners uh, indicated intent an intent to purchase some hotels or motels that would be repurposed as housing. So that is sort of um, part of the genesis of the uh, government agency or nonprofit. But beyond that, I think the, the sense is that there are uh, likely to be a lot of residents who are at risk of homelessness and who may have uh, a, a variety of different needs uh, compared to other types of rental housing. And I think there's a concern that if this uh, does not go well um, and does not have very strong oversight from those who have a, a history of managing this type of housing, that it could really actually jeopardize the reestablishment of this as, as a viable housing option um, throughout many parts of the city. Did that answer your question, Commissioner Marble? Sort of. I think I would, it feels like the reason it's only allowing for nonprofits to do it is because this is like a test case a little bit. And I would say that if you want to see it done well, bridging it beyond just that about just who can operate it to see if this product can fill a need for affordable housing in the city would be, would be to, to see if it works. Thank you. Next is Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Um, I, I feel uh, that SROs are a really important 
uh, part of the housing spectrum and that it was really unfortunate that decades ago uh, the city demolished many of them, especially in the Gateway District, and thereafter made them illegal. Um, it was something that was really important um, for people um, to come out of homelessness or to avoid uh, going into homelessness in the first place to have this option um, that was so much more affordable. And um, to the comment about disappointment about it not having uh, a requirement for kitchens or bathrooms, I, I, mean, I feel like that's kind of the defining feature of what the SRO is. Um, if it if there was a requirement to have those things, I, th I think we could probably just you know call it a studio. Um, you know, the, the the key thing about this is that you know it, by uh, requiring fewer amenities um, and allowing people to share those amenities uh, with other people in the building, uh, we we provide a much more affordable uh, option for people. And I think we really need. Uh, to to do a lot um, to address the homelessness crisis. So I, I don't feel like this is the, the appropriate time to be, you know, wading slowly into this issue. I, I think we, we should want to pass a policy uh, that really encourages uh, a lot of SROs to actually be built. And uh, to that end, um, I've submitted um, a, an amendment proposal that the clerk should have emailed everybody. Um, th there are three goals that the proposal has. Um, the version that you were emailed um, has, is, is the, the full text proposal um, that staff prepared for me that would accomplish these three goals. Um, and you know, after, after some discussion, I can um, move the whole uh, text amendment as a slate or uh, could be divided into three, but um, the three goals uh, that I have with that amendment um, are, first of all, um, to allow SROs citywide uh, currently um, by the, the current proposal um, keeps them illegal in um, R1 through R2B districts. So the most you know, exclusive parts of the city, you know, the, the mansion districts like Kenwood, um, you, you couldn't have, have an SRO there. And I don't feel that's in the spirit of the 2040 plan um, to break down um, the, the class segregation uh, that the city has had uh, for so long. Um, so I would propose um, to legalize uh, SROs in all zoning categories. And um, Second, I would propose to uh, standardize the minimum lot size requirement at 5,000 square feet. So the current proposal, the draft proposal from SAP, um, you know, has R1 and R2B. Um, you know, it's illegal for that. And then for R3, it sets the requirement at 7,500 square feet. And for R4 and up, it's at 5,000. I feel that it should just be set at 5,000 for all categories. Um, instead of imposing an extra burden on R3 that I don't feel accomplishes anything except for making it harder to do. And uh, finally, um, you know, to Commissioner Marwa's point, um, I believe that we should remove the restriction um, that this be uh, restricted to just nonprofits and, and governments, uh, because like Commissioner Marwa said, there's a lot of uh, interest in this for, for a lot of different kinds of people. And we should um, really want to encourage as much of this to actually be built as possible. And if we restrict it to only nonprofits, then I, I feel like there will be, it's kind of a, a, a stigma associated uh, with it when the, the, that doesn't need to be the case. Like, um, you know, all, all kinds of people ha could have different reasons uh, for, for choosing this type of housing. It's more affordable. Um, it, it builds community, um, you know, to, 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 to share communal space. And I, I think that's a good thing. I think, um, you know, with, with this proposal, we, we're, we're kind of legalizing uh, a mode of sharing. And um, that, that is a good thing that, that's suitable for all kinds of people, for workforce housing, for people who just want to have a lower impact on the environment. Um, and we should 
allow that and encourage it. Um, I feel that the draft proposal is a, a step in the right direction, uh, but too restrictive. Um, so uh, when, when, when I get some feedback for the three different goals um, that I've heard, uh, you know, we can um, either move all three of them at once or um, separately, but I'll, I'll move those later after some further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Um, are there any additional comments or questions, maybe reactions to Commissioner Meyer's um, proposed amendments? Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with Commissioner Meyer, um, especially about the nonprofit status and the um, zoning district regulations. Um, I think it's really important to not cluster these in already concentrated areas of poverty and like Commissioner Meyer said to just normalize it and allow it throughout the city. I think that's um, the spirit of the Minneapolis comprehensive plan and um, I think that, that there's a really cool opportunity to allow these closer to the lakes or um, you know in areas that wouldn't traditionally have these where they really will get a good response and um, allow people to live in a more like cooperative setting um you know i think there's in addition to people who um, were experiencing homelessness or are experiencing homelessness i think there's a demand for this from um just yeah younger people who want to move to the city um maybe people in school um who want to live with friends or meet new people so um i would be supportive of commissioner myers amendments um but the two i'm most supportive of are the nonprofit ownership i think anybody should be able to build these and the um location so i think they should be allowed in all zoning districts um similar to how um triplexes are allowed in any zoning district so i would agree with his amendments thank you thank you commissioner mcguire commissioner ford thank you um I will ask that we divide the question uh, between those three or vote for them separately. Um, I, uh, I totally support the notion of having this be permitted in all uh, zoning districts. Uh, that's been part of the problem over the years about we have uh, made some some areas of the city quite precious and protected them from having to um, enjoy the benefits of the rest of the world. Uh, I, uh, I'm i still leaning towards the idea of uh, requiring it, at least for starters, for nonprofit organizations. Uh, and that's frankly because I just, you know, I think about nursing homes and, uh, and uh, for-profit nursing homes and how they abuse many times, not always, of course, the uh, their customers. I'm concerned about if, um, if a corporation uh, owns uh, a SRO uh, facility or facilities, uh, they've got to be looking at the bottom line and, uh, the, and the profit for their, for their owners. And um, I'd rather the, 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 the first item to be looked at would be the, the uh, occupants. Uh, so I would like to start out with the idea of being nonprofit. But then my question, for Commissioner Meyer, can you explain to me uh, uh, your reason uh, behind the issue of 5,000 square feet being applying everywhere? I, I just missed it. I couldn't figure it. I couldn't follow it. I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so to repeat, uh, the 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 original proposal, uh, you know, kept SROs illegal for R1 and R2 set the requirement at, at a higher 7,500 square feet for R3. So that's where that R3 is where you can start, you know, building um, four plexes and such. Um, but if you wanted to build it in R3, then, then the original proposal required you to have 7,500 square feet, whereas for R4 and higher density zones, it set it at 5,000. My point of view is that if 5,000 is good enough, for these to be in, in, in R4, then it should be good enough for it, for it to be in R3. I, I feel that um, the case should be made, if there is one, uh, for why, um, why why you need extra space uh, to have one in, in R3. Um, I, I feel that's just an extra burden that will, um, you know, 
have an, have an exclusionary aspect, you know, um, and I, I think it makes the most sense uh, to just keep the minimum lot size requirement at 5,000, regardless of where in the city it is. Okay, I, I get that, I, and I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ford. Commissioner Caprini. Thank you, President. <clears throat> so um, I agree with everything that um, Commissioner Meyer has stated, except I would I would like to um, keep this where nonprofits were um, responsible for for the SRO, simply because um, Commissioner Ford brought up a very good point in regards to uh, profits in the bottom line, and um, it doesn't mean that I'm not um, in support of eventually opening up. I just think it's that sometimes, and this is just my own opinion, um, obviously, <laughs> um, sometimes uh, we do things so quickly um, because it, it's, the, it's, yes, it could be the right thing to do, but, but I think that this is something that we need to um, set a model for and so that we're able to, in the future, look at what that model, what that progress has been with this model and uh, ensure that we're adhering some of those um, uh, th those uh, those processes that um, have been successful um, to the growing public that's interested in uh, in, in developing um, some of these uh, these types of, of housing units. So so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Caprini. Commissioner Schroeder. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just uh, you know want to thank commissioners uh, for this and, and just kind of re uh, kind of talk a lot about a lot of the points. I'm one of the authors uh, of this proposed amendment or proposed uh, ordinance. Excuse me. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Commissioner Ford uh, talking about kind of some of the background about making SROs originally illegal, and that that was the same discussion we we rehad. You know, it was something that the housing type itself. Uh, was made illegal in the city of Minneapolis, and that that was has been um, something that's been missing. Um, and so I've I've heard a lot of people you know express excitement about being able to bring this back. Um, and I think when a lot of the work has been like the issue before was that they were not great neighbors in all cases, and they were a problem in in neighborhoods. Uh, so the question we really asked is how do we bring them back? How do we be able to bring back and separate the the building form with the the issue of being a, a better neighbor? Um, and so this this is, um, as many commissioners have pointed out, the the first step into making it, uh, making this legal again, and making sure that we are having more of this housing um, throughout Minneapolis. Um, it is, I think, that Commissioner Meyer has some great suggestions um, for the future when we are able to get a little more feedback. Um, this this proposal really is um, looking at how can the the city move into this area. You know, how do we make sure we have a policy that that's going to work, um, that is going to make sure that these uh, type of house, this type of housing, you know, fits the need and also is a, a good neighbor for the community, and also make sure that the city staff um, can enforce it. A lot of this will depend on the city's ability to enforce that uh, and to work with folks. And we we know we can work with nonprofits, and we know we can work with our partners um, on this. Um, so I, I appreciate the discussion, uh, but I I will not be supporting the um, proposed amendments. Thank you, Commissioner McGuire. Sorry, my computer's a little bit laggy. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add one more thing that um, I think it's really important that we're talking about this during June, which is Pride Month too, because just for a lot of um, a little bit of context when I was doing research on these, they used to provide a really um, big housing market for LGBTQ. AI um, people in the 1900s that didn't have um, elsewhere to go. So I think this can really help a lot of communities that don't have other places to live. So I just wanted to add that context and um, thank everybody for working on it during this month. Thank you for making that point, Commissioner McGuire. Commissioner Sweezy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam President. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Schrader, Council Member Schrader, for his uh, comments on it. You know, we talked about this. Um, at least once, and I think maybe more than once at Committee of the Whole, um, and went through this and heard those arguments then. Um, and I think, you know, um, without rehashing the whole debate here, I think introducing this now in a graduated way 
and in a thoughtful way, um, like the ordinance is proposing is the best way to do it. It can always be expanded. Um, but, you know, some of the things that people saw and the reason for the repeal of it a number of years ago are things we want to avoid also uh, currently. And I think that speaks to learning lessons for things. And like I said, there's no reason it can't be expanded later, but it seems to me that this is a good start as is. Um, and I agree with Commissioner Schrader and would not support a motion to amend. Thank you, Commissioner Sweezy. Commissioner Baxley. Yeah, thank you. I, I think um, it's such an important part of um, creating a truly livable city. And I, I get concerned when we start to mandate or define the idea of good neighbor. So I, I think um, it's a particularly appropriate time to sort of amp up that discussion. I think this proposal, um, especially making it available to any part of the city, um, will be an important part of that conversation. Um, so um, I am supportive of, of the amendment to allow it uh, to be executed anywhere in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Baxley. Commissioner Ford. Thank you. I, I appreciate the comments of uh, the Councilman Schrader and, and others uh, about the notion of uh, uh, getting our doing it gradually and I understand the concern there but my concern is that uh, the history of this city is that those gradual things actually don't happen uh, when it comes to R1s and R2s and so forth and uh, I, I don't I just I'm quite concerned that if we pass this uh, it will be the new no normal and nothing will get changed after this uh, and we'll find ourselves with a uh, economically segregated community still. So I will be a support, uh, supporting the uh, two of the three uh, proposals today. Thank you, Commissioner Ford. Any additional comments or questions by the commission? Commissioner Caprini. So um, can you please just kind of lay out exactly what it is because I've, I'm hearing I understand what we're talking about, but I'm hearing these uh, this amendment and then some of the comments, and I don't know if we are. Do we have to um, vote on the uh, amendment and and then if it doesn't pass, do another amendment uh, to include what uh, some of us have agreed that uh, we want to see going forward? So just please spell it out for a girl, please. Sure, I will take a stab at it and I am uh, happily accepting help <laughs> from others. Uh, we need to vote on this regardless because this is a, the single, um, uh, the SROs, that's a, a new uh, piece uh, being added to uh, the code. So there is a vote on the table and there's a recommendation from staff no matter what. Uh, what is happening with this discussion is that um, Commissioner Meyer is hoping to uh, amend that recommendation uh, from staff to change um, three pieces of uh, what is being proposed to be added to the code. And that was one was with the expansion of which um, districts the uh, SROs can be allowed in. Uh, the other is the minimum lot requirement, and the third one is the organizations who can um, uh, operate these facilities. Uh, these amendments are in a, well, I wouldn't say in addition, they are intended to change three pieces that are part of the recommendation of staff, if that makes sense. That, that makes complete sense. So, so just bear with me for a second. So, if I were to agree with two out of the three, right? Mm -hmm. Or is there four? <laughs> two out of the three. Um, then would I have to make some kind of three? Thank you. Um, would I, two out of the three, is, is there a need to amend what's being, what, what's going to eventually be voted on? But then there's also the staff recommendation, which is just a flat out there. This is what we recommend. But then also Commissioner Meyer's uh, suggestions as to what should be amended, correct? 
Uh, well, it's either or. It can't be both uh, the Commissioner Myers' recommendations and the staff recommendation at the same time. They so are in two. conflict with one another. So, so you can't have two out of what? Yes. Yeah, so we will be like if the um, motions are made to amend the staff recommendation. Um, and I heard that uh, the desire is to separate the motions, the three of them, and not put them in one vote. Um, then we will uh, basically vote on those amendments to be added to the staff recommendation, practically altering uh, staff's recommendation. Okay, because I am in support of them being anywhere in the, the city. Um, but I'm opposed to uh, um, opening it up for um, for profit or anyone else outside of nonprofits to to run them. So, so yeah, I think I, I think I got it. OK, thank you okay. so much. I appreciate your patience. Uh, no problem. Um, actually, you are. Thank you. Sorry, um, I'm going back to the chat. I apologize, um, Rachel. No, um, staff was asking whether or not uh, this has been opened up for uh, public hearing. It has not. This is still the question and answer of the commission after staff's presentation, if that makes sense. We still have not moved on to the next step of public hearing. Uh, so, um, OK, great. Um, Commissioner Meyer, did you still want to follow up on Commissioner Caprini's question? Or did I get it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you got it. I, I, I guess you can just, I, I can just clarify, like, um, like my amendments will get voted up or down to the staff proposal. And then wh whether my am amendments pass or not, then we vote on the, the final motion with whichever amendment amendments pass. So you can definitely, Commissioner Caprini, um, support the amendments that you like and then um, oppose the ones that you don't. And then if one of the ones that you don't makes it into the final motion, then, then you have to decide whether you would still support um, the final motion with an amendment that you didn't like included in it. So um, that, that's how it'll go. Thanks. Thank you for that clarification, Commissioner Meyer. Any additional questions or comments from uh, the Commission for staff? I actually have one before um, we open the public hearing, and this is related to opening it to other um, districts and uh, basically how many of, the, uh, I think this was part of the conversation before, how many rooms can potentially be allowed in um, in a like say R1 uh, or R2 and um, practically making it um, only possible to be looking like a duplex. Um, and so I I want, uh, I, I'm asking staff if you can um, talk about that a little bit. And then my other question is, uh, would it at all be possible for someone to turn an existing structure into um, the status of an SRO, basically. Sure, uh, Commissioner Esmaili, uh, the, to the answer your second question first, yes, uh, existing buildings could be converted. They would have to meet building code requirements. And once you would get, I believe it's uh, 10 residents or more, there would be some sprinkler requirements. Um, that could be a potential hurdle for some conversions of existing buildings. Um, to your question about uh, um, the lower intensity districts, and I think uh, kind of reference to the scale of a duplex, for example, uh, these would be uh, subject to the same kind of floor area ratio standards and other standards of um, you know, single family homes, duplexes or triplexes in those districts. Uh, I just want to make sure I, uh, that it's clear, though, kind of what the basis for our recommendation uh, is for restricting them to R3 or higher in that uh, essentially R3 in a, on a larger lot aligns with uh, the interior two uh, uh, um, comp plan uh, designation 
And uh, you know, we, we've we, there have been a couple of references to the spirit and intent of Minneapolis 2040, but one thing that is quite clear in black and white in Minneapolis 2040 is that in interior one and on standard size lots in interior two, uh, we made a commitment that there would be three units or less allowed in those districts. Um, and as I understand uh, Commissioner um, Myers' uh, recommendations, uh, there would be no such restriction on the number of units. You would uh, essentially be able to fit as many units into uh, the, the allowed volume of the building through FAR uh, as is allowed in those districts. So from staff's perspective, it seems like we would um, uh, be pulling a little bit, a bit of a bait and switch uh, uh, um, on folks uh, compared to what we stated in, in Minneapolis 2040 about the number of units that would be uh, in, in a building in those particular districts. Thank you. And um, one additional clarification before I um, ask Commissioner Meyer, um, would if that was the case and, um, um, and there was uh, anything conflicting, would that then take us to the next step of potentially amending the comp plan? Well, uh, Commissioner Smiley, that is one potential um, uh, um, path that the, the commission or, and the city council can pursue is amendments to the, the built form uh, districts in Minneapolis 2040, certainly. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Meyer. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify that because I, I just want to say I, I did not at all intend uh, to change that aspect of the, of the 2040 plan um, and don't think I said I did it everywhere anywhere. Um, you know, I um, intended for this to just be legalizing SROs citywide um, with all of, you know, the other um, restrictions that are currently in existence remaining in place, um, including as Mr. Wittenberg said, you know, the, the FARs, height and other things um, that restrict density and I assumed that it would also apply to the number of units that are allowed in a building. Um, my intent was to make it uh, so that if you're in a zoning area where it's um, three units are only allowed on a lot, then simply by by legalizing this, we would just be saying like you can have you know three units, um, but they can be SRO units um, with. Uh, you know, no kitchen or bathroom requirement within within the unit itself. Um, so, you know, uh, while the public hearing is commencing, um, Mr. Wittenberg or other staff, if you can help me um, prepare an amendment that makes that clear that that I am uh, not changing that aspect of my proposal, then then I will in include that in my amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Baxley. Sorry, one clarification. Does the city uh, define? I'm curious about the definition of unit. Is an SRO considered a unit, or is that, or, or is that? Am I playing some semantic games here? But I'm just curious from the city staff's point of view. Uh, commissioners, yes, uh, we are defining uh, a single room occupancy housing unit. As as a unit of housing, that's distinguished from dwelling unit, but but that the room that someone would be residing in would be would be a unit. Okay, thanks, Jason. Yeah. Any additional questions uh, for staff from the commission, Commissioner Marwa? Hi, Jason. I had a quick question um, about. I was bringing it back to the nonprofit amendment that um, Commissioner Meyer was was proposing. Is this type of housing currently, if a develop if a small scale developer wanted to build out units that did not have a bathroom and a kitchen and were not meant for students but were with a shared living arrangement like that in um, in any zoning district across cities, can someone build that if it's only say there's four units like that and they all share? A communal kitchen and bathroom space is that allowable, or does that have to be 
through this SRO. I guess I'm a little confused about the idea that the all SROs have to be kind of done by nonprofits and include, you know, health aid and all of these other kind of aspects to it, or is this a product that right now cannot be built anyway, and it has to go through this type of um, code? Uh, Commissioner Mawat, uh, it, it's correct that this type of housing cannot be currently constructed in the city. Uh, um, the exception to that is if you're building a supportive housing or nursing home or something like that, each unit it doesn't need its own kitchen or restroom facilities. Uh, however, um, beyond those limited exceptions, uh, one cannot build uh, units without a, a complete kitchen or rest restroom facility right now. Okay, thank you. I think I'll continue to support Commissioner Meyer's amendment on this because I think that this needs, for me, I think this will broaden out and allow for that type of housing, even if it's not necessarily in a supportive environment in the type of way that I think some of the intention behind SROs is, is led. Thank you. Um, thank you. I so apologize, I still have another couple of questions for staff. Um, one is that uh, the uh, the code as written is explicitly saying that the um, the units will be operated uh, by nonprofit government agency or healthcare um, agency. Does that mean that it can possibly be um, built through a partnership with uh, private sector, but still operated uh, by nonprofit or government agency? That's one question. And then my other question is that um, considering the um, uh, the kind of a maximum uh, number of units within like R1 and R2 like uh, in that area, what would the difference of a structure with SROs be with a regular house with separate rooms that are being rented to several different people? Uh, so I'm just kind of wondering um, how, how that uh, that's different. Sure. Uh, uh, Commissioner Smiley, to your first question, yes, given that uh, really the, the issue uh, with the nonprofit and government agencies is who is operating the facility. Uh, someone certainly could um, uh, partner with uh, uh, a private developer or contractor, for example, to to proposed to construct uh, the building, uh, if that answers your, your first question. Um, your, your second question, I think you're sort of getting at one of the things that um, staff um, uh, felt uh, uh, about the lowest intensity districts is that when we're talking about a three unit SRO, that that's not, in our view, substantially different than really renting out a house to a group of unrelated people. Or, or renting out three units in a triplex to a group of unrelated people. Um, so uh, to some degree, that seems like a distinction that doesn't have much of a difference. Uh, clear, clearly, there would be some differences. Um, um, I mean, typically in a, in a rooming or SRO type of situation, um, you are you're just literally leasing a room to somebody with and it's got a, a deadbolt lock on it, right? Um, and, and that is generally not something that is allowed in, um, uh, in um, uh, rental housing otherwise. Um, however, our, our regulatory services staff did clarify that if someone is, uh, uh, owns a single family home and wants to rent out a room uh, to, to, to someone, um, that, that's a situation that the city does not prevent uh, from happening. Um, just, just to be clear ab about that. Thank you for the clarification. Any additional questions or comments from the commission? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you, Jason and Amber for your presentation. Uh, again, uh, and answering questions, I will now open the public hearing on this item. Um, is let me take a quick look at whether we had anyone signed up for this. I don't think it doesn't seem like we have. 
but uh, if there's anyone to uh, speak to this item, uh, you can press star six to unmute yourself uh, and then start with uh, your name and address and continue with your comment. Okay, thank you. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Hi, yes. Are you here to comment on? Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Can you start with your name and address? Oh, start now or? Yes, you can like start now. Talking about some other stuff. No, we're done uh, talking about that and we have moved start on to the public hearing. You can, you can comment on the um, single room occupancy. Okay, I'll hit star six now, thank you. Um, hello? Sorry, I think we lost you. Um, if you're here to comment on uh, the uh, item number hello? 11, yes. Hello? Yes, hi. How you doing? Um, my name is um, Alex Frank. I am a local developer uh, in Minneapolis. Um, recent project at 2410 DuPont Avenue North I currently own. Just uh, have a few comments about um, this SRO um, changes. Um, from my perspective, as I look at, um, I would appreciate the work being done. I would, um, hopefully you all can uh, push for it to be allowed across the city because um, one of the things as I'm hearing people go back and forth, you have to realize um, it's already happening across the city. So by making it legal, you take it out of the shadows and uh, in a way of, of regulating it as well and also get the quality of um, where people are staying, uh, you know, uh, to a higher level. So I think that's a big thing there. Um, the other comment about the minimum lot size by um, reducing it down, let's say closer to the 5,000 square feet, that opens up a lot of the vacant land that the city owns for it to be developed and put these type of units on versus saying arbitrarily 7,500 um, square feet. And the thing about the size, I have a, I'm started looking at um, what could this look like in a particular area. And so, there's some that you can go as high as, you know, eight units in an SRO and still look like a single family home. So I think there's something there for the group to consider when um, when trying to limit how many units or what does that look like. The economy is a scale, so if you have to build, that helps you get to the appropriate um, the cost structure if, if you're able to increase it. And the other thing is we talk about who should operate it. Um, you know, I, I think there's different models out there, profit, nonprofit, the certain guide rails are put in place. I think a for-profit can do it and be quite successful because in other parts of the country, it's being done by for-profits and they have people moving across the country in the SRO type of model called co-living that, you know, it could be done. So just have to discuss and see what's the appropriate Way moving forward, but again, I think it's great work. I think uh, citywide is the right move. Take it out of the shadows, and can regulate it and, and, and give opportunity out there for additional people to live an appropriate life. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else um, who would like to speak to this item? If there is, please press star six to unmute yourself and then start with your name and address. I'll give it a few seconds to make sure that there isn't anyone who's trying to unmute themselves. Okay, well, seeing no one else, uh, I will now close the public hearing um, on this item. Just the last call, whether or not there's any additional discussion or questions by the commission related to this item before I ask for a motion. Commissioner Meyer, you would like to start with the amendments. 
Yeah. Um, first, I just want to start by saying, um, you're just reminding everyone of the context of the encampments and in the context of, you know, the comment about, um, you know, SROs previously having been bad neighbors. I mean, I, I feel like it's an unequivocal step up um, from the status quo for a lot of people. And then also, like others have said, um, you know, if, if we're expansive about it, this can be used for um, workhouse well, you know, work, work housing and, um, and co-living. Um, so I, I do really believe it makes the most sense uh, to not restrict this to nonprofits. And it's true that we, we could expand on this later, but there's, um, you know, a significant downside to doing that and that people aren't going to be able to uh, take advantage of this low cost housing in the meantime. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll start out with the, the First Amendment uh, to uh, remove the restriction um, uh, that limits it to just nonprofit and government bodies. Okay, a motion has been made to um, not restrict this to, again, government agencies, nonprofits, and healthcare agencies. Uh, is there a second? Commissioner Baxley. Second. Thank you. A motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion on this? Okay. Seeing none, I ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. Nay. Commissioner Ford. No. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Uh, aye. Commissioner Schrader. No. Commissioner Sweezy. No. Chair Smiley. No. So in that case, we have a tie of five yeses and five noes. I knew that was going to happen, and uh, I was going to ask. Um, I was going to ask staff on how we should proceed uh, with a, is that a, is that a no? Is that why you're, yeah, yeah, a tie is a no. That was my understanding, but I still want a confirmation. Um, President, President Smiley, this is Ken yes. from the clerk's office. With, with a tie vote, the, the motion to amend does fail. Okay, thank you so much for confirming that. Um, that uh, motion fails for the amendment. Um, Commissioner Meyer, would you like to proceed with the next one? Yes. Um, so first I have a question for staff. When we um, passed the parking reforms and uh, set a restriction for the bedrooms in um, certain parts of the university district, we set that at nine bedrooms, was that correct? Uh, Commissioner Meyer, that sounds right to me. Yes, I believe it was nine. Okay. Um, like the um, commenter during the public hearing said, you know, I, I feel like um, approximately that many bedrooms can fit into a building and, and still look like a standard um, single family unit or, or sorry, up, up to a, a tri tri triplex, you know, um, the type of thing that is allowed under the 2040 plan. Um, so I am going to move uh, to allow SROs um, in all zoning categories, uh, but with a restriction of only up to nine bedrooms in R1 through R2B zoning.
I'm sorry, I was having difficulties. Um, a motion has been made. Uh, Commissioner McGuire? I'll second the motion. Thank you. Um, it's been seconded as well. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, I ask the clerk to please call the roll. Wait, 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 no, no, no. I'm sorry. I tried to type comment as quickly as I possibly could. So just, okay. just very, very quickly, just tell me, you, you, uh, Commissioner Meyer, you said R1 through R2? R2B, yes. Uh, R2B. So can, can, can somebody quickly just tell me what that looks like? Is that, um, does, is, are there areas that are, um, oh gosh, outside of North Minneapolis and Northeast Minneapolis included? in those areas is that a yes? my understanding is yes um, so, so but it is across the city i just want to make sure i don't I'm have up. the map right in front of me to so say exactly going, where but can staff clarify if you can quickly uh, commissioners the r1 through r2b districts are are essentially the lowest intensity districts um that to some degree, ring the outer edges of, of the city, and they uh, appear in, uh, throughout uh, all sectors of, of the city. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, my brain works in districts um, in terms of like Minneapolis Public Schools, so now I understand. I'm, I've got it. I've got it. It's it's in there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional comments or questions, Commissioner Sweezy? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. Just so just to clarify, then the this amendment would allow in, let's just say, R1 districts anywhere in the city, um, you could put up next in the middle of two single family homes, a place like this that looks like a single family home, but has nine separate living unit bedrooms in it. That's what this amendment would do. Correct. Yeah, and just to be clear, I, I can't get behind that at all. I, I think that's a clear bait and switch to agree uh, strongly with what Mr. Wittenberg said about that. Um, and, um, you know, um, the comp plan is what it is and R1, people have a right to expect, um, you know, that we abide by those. So, no, I can't get behind this one at all. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Sweezy. Commissioner, um... Wait, Commissioner Meyer, do you have a response to Commissioner Sweezy's comment? Yes, I do. Um, okay. So right now we allow triplexes citywide, and and how many bedrooms can you have a triplex? Is it it's, is it four or is it even limited? I mean per, per unit with with each unit, how many bedrooms can you have? Uh, commissioners, there's essentially no limit within the volume of the building uh, outside of the university area overlay district. Right. Yeah, um, so, I mean, uh, Commissioner Sweezy, like al already in the status quo, if if you had um, the space within the limitations of the FAR and that setbacks and all those things, uh, you could have a triplex with three bedrooms each. And I feel that um, my proposal is perfectly consistent with that. Thank you. Commissioner Olson. Um, never mind, that answered my question. Okay. I will add one comment though, is, um, is that there, in my, in my mind, there's a, a very clear difference between that. Um, that is nine, but that nine bedroom is nine separate units as opposed to the three units, regardless of the number of bedroom. So you're technically talking about nine Households versus three households. So that's no, we're talking about one household versus one versus three now, right? Because this is the, this is this did catch me up. Um, this is something I didn't quite get when, um, when 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 staff said this, answering I believe it was Commissioner Baxley's question about how they're defining unit, right? Because they're they're saying that if you have lots of SRO units in one building, then they're still counting that as like one unit. Is that did I get that um, wrong? My thought, my understanding was that each bedroom counts as a unit, but maybe I'm incorrect. Can you please confirm, Jason? Uh, you're correct, uh, Commissioner Smiley, that each essentially independent um, bedroom 
uh, would be considered a unit, and that's how it's being defined um, in the ordinance, I believe. Yep. Okay. So when you answer Commissioner Baxley's question, sorry, I. Um, can you can you restate what you answered to Commissioner Baxley's question about the the definition of units previously? I, I think what I just the same thing that I just indicated to Commissioner Smiley that um, each separate leasable unit would be a separate a room would be a separate unit from from staff's standpoint. Okay. And from that standard of uh, standpoint of the definition that we're uh, coming up with for single room occupancy housing unit. Okay. Um, I will. I'll, I'll go forward with the with the amendment. I still think it makes sense uh, to um, basically treat things based on um, the size of of the building and the footprint of the building rather than what's inside it. Sure. Any additional comments or questions to this amendment uh, from the commission? Okay, seeing none, I ask the clerk to please call the roll. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. I'm sorry, could you please t tell me where uh, this, this child is getting picked up? So, so tell me where we're at. We are voting on the um, on the amendment that Commissioner Meyer made to allow uh, I, okay, this everywhere with the restriction of nine bedrooms. Aye. Oh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. No, and it's not because I don't like the intent of it. It just feels like the discussion today means that it might just need a little bit more thinking through um, before we make such a, a big decision on it. So I'm going to vote no. Thank you. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. No. Commissioner Schrader. No. Commissioner Sweezy. No. Chair Ismaili. No. So since that's a tie, then it's a failed motion. Okay, thank you. Um, so that motion fails. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, I uh, go back to you. I think you have a, a third one. Go ahead. Uh, the third one, I move to standardize uh, the minimum lot size requirement at 5,000 square feet. Thank you. A motion has been made. Is there a second? Commissioner Olson? Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion or question? Commissioner, oh wait, Commissioner Ford, do you have a question? You don't, no. sorry. Okay. Commissioner Marwa. Uh, my question is for Commissioner Schrader to just kind of explain what was the council's thinking um, behind uh, not the, the specifications around lot sizes that was included. Sure, no, I appreciate the question. I'm going to defer to staff, see if they have those specifics on that. Sure, uh, Commissioners, our intent was to um, very literally interpret Minneapolis 2040 guidance that in the interior two, that once you have uh, more than three units, uh, that, that is uh, to take place on a larger lot. And when we uh, did previous uh, amendments to implement that, uh, the where we arrived at was four units or more are allowed on a 7,500 square foot lot. Uh, so we're aligning it, uh, the SRO uh, allowances uh, with with exactly where we allowed four unit or more residential buildings. Any other questions of Kosha Marwa? I do, sorry, just to, but the, the size and the impact of these types of units, you know, are less, it's not four full housing units, you know, as far as water and, you know, 
other issues that come up is there there was when we're talking about these as the units we're talking about the rooms correct what are being called the full units yeah Sure. Okay. Are, are people going to take fewer showers because they live in an SRO unit or I'm not quite sure of the well you don't need four water use, not, for example okay well I mean you're not having four showers in there compared to having one not right. that people would take less showers I guess I'm just saying that the, the yeah I don't know Commissioner Ford Yes, thank you. Um, I understand, Jason, your comment about uh, where you got to um, to 7,500 for four units and above. But um, what about a um, a uh, SRO structure that has three units? Um, why should that still be seven and a half thousand square feet? Yeah, uh, Commissioner, that is a good question. Uh, essentially, we, uh, I think I kind of alluded to earlier that when we're talking about uh, units of that scale, um, it's, one starts to wonder what the difference is between just renting out a house to unrelated people who share a kitchen and an SRO um, a type of arrangement. Uh, so we just hadn't contemplated uh, or recommended rather um, SROs of that scale. Um, our, our assumption would be that SROs would would generally have four units or, or more in them. So then um, given that assumption, uh, if there happens to be a three unit one, uh, uh, why not allow it on a 5,000 square foot uh, lot? Or am I, am I missing the point here? No, I, I think you, you're you're getting it, and that certainly is an option. Uh, I, I uh, tried to clear up the misunderstanding with Commissioner Meyer by sending him a a, a motion just a bit ago that would uh, accomplish that if that was the the um, commission's desire. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments on this motion? Um, I just have one quick question for staff. So does that mean that if it was in fact like say 5,000 uh, because you had calculated that it would make sense for it to be 7,500, but if it was 5,000 then we would run into um, continuously asking for variances basically. Uh, Commissioner Smiley, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following the question. Sorry. Like if it was um, a higher number of units, would we run into issues with FAR or anything else? And and that's why. Or did I not quite understand that correctly? Um, yeah, that's not ne necessarily the issue. Um, there, there perhaps is a, a, a longer answer to um, why Minneapolis 2040 had that standard related to uh, four plus unit buildings. And, and that was generally that the, uh, the patterns of four plus unit buildings in this across the city generally uh, are, are that they are that are built on larger than standard sized lots. Uh, so when when we translated that to regulation. That was the, the standard we, we came up with. Uh, but certainly um, one can imagine um, smaller um, structures that could comply with um, with maximum uh, uh, floor area ratio and other standards in those lower intensity districts if you had um, smaller scale uh, units or SRO units in them that wouldn't necessarily require variances. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments for well, on this motion? Commissioner Meyer. Yeah, I, I think by passing my amendment here, we would reduce the number of variances that we would see because if you did want to have you know, a, a smaller scale um, SRO proposal, like this gives you more flexibility to do that. Um, and I'm seeing Commissioner Kapini's comments. Uh, um, 
the motion is to uh, standardize the uh, minimum lot size requirement at 5,000 square feet. So the impact of this motion, Commissioner Caprini, is for the R3 zone, uh, which currently um, the staff proposal sets the requirement at 7,500 square feet. For R4 and higher density areas, which is like the corridors, um, it's it's set at 5,000. So this makes it 5,000 um, for R3 as well. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Any additional questions or comments before we move on to the vote? Okay, seeing none, I ask the clerk to please call the uh, roll on this motion. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. No. Commissioner Sweezy. No. Commissioner Sweezy. Oh, sorry, no. Thank you. Chair is smiling. Aye. So that's eight yeas and two nays. Thank you, that motion passes. Um, so to sum up, we currently have one um, successful amendment to the staff's recommendations for the single room occupancy um, code basically addition and that is to normalize or sorry um, basically make the uh, minimum lot size requirement the same across the districts that allows SRO. So with that we still have to make we still need to vote on the entirety of what is in front of us. So do I have a motion for the amended text amendment <laughs> to these regulations from anyone? Uh, Commissioner Ford. Something I must like. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I move that we um, uh, ad adopt the, uh, the report uh, with the amendment uh, as amended. Excuse me. Thank you been uh, moved and Commissioner McGuire. Second, and I have a comment as well. Sure. Uh, so uh, I mean, move seconded with comments. Go on. Um, would it be possible for at our next meeting for staff to follow up with a map of what this amendment does and just kind of highlight parcels where this would be allowed? I think I have some of the similar concerns as Commissioner Caprini as to where um, kind of what this is, where this is allowed and just making sure we're not clustering things. So I'll support it tonight, but I just thought that'd be some helpful follow up just for us visual people. Yes, that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McGuire. Any additional comments or questions? OK. Seeing none, I please I ask the staff to please uh, call the roll on on this. Commissioner Baxley. Aye. Commissioner Caprini. Aye. Commissioner Ford. Aye. Commissioner Marwa. Aye. Commissioner McGuire. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Olson. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Sweezy. No. Chair is smiling. Aye. Nine yeas and one nay. Thank you. That motion passes.
Uh, so with that, that concludes all of our public hearing items. Are there any announcements from staff at this point? Okay, I don't think there is anything. Um, anything from the commissioners um, that you would like to bring uh, forward? Commissioner Caprini. Uh, this weekend is um, Juneteenth celebration. I certainly hope um, all of you will find the time to find um, a celebration somewhere uh, near where you live. Um, I can make a great plug for um, Bethune School is having a huge celebration as well as Phyllis Wheatley Community Center. The, um, the great thing about that is that they are connected so you can uh, kill two birds with one stone. So mm -hmm. I hope for uh, good weather, and I certainly hope you find the time to celebrate um, freedom. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that plug. Any anything else that any commissioners would like to mention before we adjourn? OK, well, if not, and without objection, I declare this meeting adjourned. Um, our next planning commission meeting is on Monday, June 28th, and our next uh, committee of the whole meeting is this Thursday, uh, June 17th. Um, and with that, thank you, everyone. Hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Night. Take care, Night. folks.